Welcome everybody. You are in the right place. Welcome to the Stand Out Earth webinar, Toxics in the U.S. and the Next 40 Years, What Will It Take to Protect Public Health? Our presenters, um, I'm Ann, sorry, I'm Ann, I'm Pernick, I'm with Stand Out Earth, and um, we have Sarah Dahl from Safer States and Andy Egregious from Safer Chemicals, Healthy Families. Thank you so much, Andy and Sarah, um, for your preparation and all your um, thoughtful work to get ready for today. We're so happy to have you and also really happy to have um, our audience. Welcome, everybody. Andy Egregious is National Campaign Director of Safer uh, Chemicals Healthy Families, a coalition which includes 450 organizations and 11 million individuals from across the country, including parents, health professionals, advocates for people with learning and developmental disabilities, reproductive health advocates, environmentalists, and businesses from across the nation. They share the common concern about toxic chemicals in our homes, places of work, and products we use every day. Previously, Andy worked on environmental health and government reform issues for state organizations in New Jersey and California, and later for the National Environmental Trust in Washington. And Andy, thank you so much for being with us today. I'm going to introduce Sarah, and then we'll, uh, Andy's going to start his presentation. Sarah Dahl is the National Director at Safer States, a network of diverse environmental health coalitions and organizations in states around the country, working for new state and national chemical policies to protect families, communities, and the environment from the devastating impacts of our society's heavy use of chemicals, and also contribute to the formation of a cleaner, greener economy. Sarah is also Bright Choices Program Director at Healthy Babies Bright Future, Futures, which is working to limit babies' exposure to toxics in their first 1,000 days of life. Previously, Sarah worked with Hands on Greater Portland and the Oregon Environmental Council. And Sarah, thank you again for being with us today. And with that, I'm going to do a couple things. I'm going to close out my webcam and Sarah's webcam, and we'll set Andy up and bring up his slides. Hang on just a moment while we do all that. All right, Andy, are you seeing your your slides up? I am. Yeah. Thank okay. you. Great. And I'm just going to make one last little adjustment on my screen. Okay, thank you. Take it away. Great. Uh, thank you very much. So that's me, and <laughs> I run Safer Chemicals Healthy Families. Uh, I'm not used to having the camera on all the time, so um, uh, I just hope I don't make faces uh, <laughs> like Mr. Trump made um, two nights ago. You can uh, privately uh, email me if, uh, if you have any feedback on that. Um, let me go to the next slide. Um, Anne described who we are, but I thought it was worth lingering on for a moment, that it, uh, while the national environmental community and the state-based and community-based environmental community uh, definitely has been leading the way on chemical activism and policy for a long time and formed the bulk of uh, the original part of this coalition. Uh, we also represent a lot of parents, organizations, mom activists, health professionals like uh, nurses, uh, uh, doctors, uh, folks that are in disease affiliated groups um, like the Learning Disabilities Association, the Breast Cancer Fund, uh, Breast Cancer Action, others, and the biggest industrial union uh, in the country, um, uh, and the United Steelworkers, United Auto Workers, uh, just to say that the, the broad group of people that came around um, focusing Congress's attention on the urgency of reforming chemical policy uh, is, uh, is quite profound, and it was driven by the evidence that has been piling up over the 30 years that TSCA, um, the Toxic Substances Control Act, was not working. Uh, this evidence has bubbled up that chemicals were impacting public health that they're uh, related to, in some cases, behind the increase in many of the chronic diseases that we see on the rise in American And that reform is fundamentally about that public health intervention. That's what it's about. And if it works, it's because the government is now intervening to prevent people from coming into contact with chemicals that could contribute to disease and disability uh, and also um, to protect the environment. And the photo in the backdrop there is of our second um, stroller brigade. Uh, uh, Jennifer Beals, the actress, was headlining this one. And uh, it was a combination of that 
broad coalition and then a lot of um, especially mom-led activism uh, that helped uh, keep this debate on track and when it went off track helped it get back on track. Um, so go to the next slide. So uh, the reform is called the Frank Lautenberg Chemical Safety for the 21st Century Act. Um, the, it's taking hold, so far people just calling it the Lautenberg Act or the Lautenberg Chemical Safety Act. Uh, and, you know, Senator Lautenberg, I worked uh, with the late Senator Lautenberg um, for, for years and always admired uh, his commitment. He was one of these people that always referred to his upbringing, where he came from in Patterson, New Jersey, which I grew up right near as well in Bloomfield, New Jersey, and really thought of environmental issues as an extension of basic uh, working class uh, labor type issues. He would talk about the conditions in the mills in Patterson and um, from kind of an occupational health and safety focus and outward to the community and then onward to consumers. And, and I think that he's someone who always uh, uh, knew uh, what he was for and fought for it for a long time. Um, as some folks know, shortly after um, the compromise legislation was unveiled, uh, Senator Lautenberg passed away and uh, we had this long fight over the last three years over the details of uh, this legislation. And um, the, you know, the fight went sideways for a while. For a while, I would even say it went upside down, where you had the industry uh, saying they were the reformers and all of us um, who were the reformers were being accused of obstructionism. Um, but I think we've turned it around and turned it, gone it back on track. And at the end of the day, I uh, believe the prevailing view there's a range of views. Some people opposed the final bill while acknowledging some of the good things. Uh, a few groups endorsed it, but very few. But I think most were in the space where our campaign ended up, which was um, it, we were disappointed by the outcome as it relates to the size of the problem of chemicals and their impact on public health and the environment. But the bill was, became, over time, after a lot of fight, net positive in that there were more proactive public health reforms in there, but then there were um, special interest things or things that would dial anything back. So ultimately we ended up with something that, uh, if I had to summarize in a nutshell, EPA can finally now get in on the act of intervening to protect public health and the environment from toxic chemicals. It just won't be doing that at a pace and with a scope, at least initially or unless something changes, that really solves the problem. So next slide. I want to highlight some of the achievements in the bill. And I hope you can see this. Um, and some of these are very big. I think the core one, uh, as many of you uh, may know, one of the reasons that the original law, the Toxic Substance Control Act, didn't work is EPA spent years putting together the proposed restriction on asbestos, and then that was thrown out of court. And it basically shut down the EPA's ability to tackle uh, the chemicals that were already in commerce, uh, the ones that had been grandfathered under the law in 1976, which is still the bulk of chemicals in commerce. It was uh, uh, 64,000 chemicals that they had that were grandfathered at the time. Um, and there were issues in that lawsuit or in that court decision that, that basically sent the message to EPA that you'll never be able to use this law. And uh, the most fundamental reform in this bill is that it addressed those issues. And those issues include that it went from being a cost-benefit standard where you literally had to prove that the money saved by protecting people from asbestos um, uh, outweighed the, the cost of removing asbestos from the economy. And it moved to a health-only standard, which is very important. And it also got rid of a requirement that EPA choose the least burdensome way of addressing a chemical. So the reform tackled those issues, and then it, it did something more, which is it explicitly requires EPA to identify and protect any population that is disproportionately exposed to the chemical or disproportionately susceptible to injury from the chemical. And this should provide, if fully implemented, a very powerful new uh, uh, handles to protect the workers who are disproportionately exposed, communities along the fence line who get disproportionate exposure, and then um, 
uh, susceptible populations, uh, the developing fetus, pregnant women, um, children, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, they, have to, they have to protect, uh, not just identify, but then the final reform has to remove uh, the risk, the unreasonable risk from that's presented, that's chemical presents to those groups. And that's something that we've been trying to get uh, into the law in, in many contexts, and I, I think it was a significant victory. And it's very clearly identified that in the legislative history and everything else that we're talking about workers, we're talking about uh, heavily exposed communities, and that kind of thing. Um, something that we uh, were able to, had, had, was a part of our platform from the beginning, was to deal with persistent bioaccumulative toxins, uh, toxic chemicals as a, a particular class that EPA would have to identify and uh, uh, move more quickly on. Um, we retained a portion of that in the final bill. Uh, it's limited to a subset of the chemicals that EPA had already identified as PBTs on their work plan process, which is a, a list of chemicals they already prioritized as bad. So I think at the end of the day, we're talking about seven to 10 chemicals um, with this. But those chemicals uh, basically skip an evaluation phase and go straight to uh, how, how much can we reduce this chemical in the economy to protect people. And that could be very important if they implement it correctly. They made it easier in the bill to order manufacturers to test the toxicity of their chemicals. One of the big failures of TSCA is it required the EPA to go through a lengthy full notice and comment rulemaking, which is a, a years-long undertaking, just to require testing. And the bill got rid of that, allows EPA to require toxicity testing um, based on for almost any reason uh, with a simple order. They just basically say, hey, you, you have to do some testing. Um, and that could be a major improvement. There are some limited improvements to confidential business information, uh, which have been um, uh, very abused. Uh, I think the part of the confidential business information, this is where the industry was claiming almost everything about the chemical as secret under the old law, including the name of the chemical and sometimes who they were as the company, um, you know, where it was going to be used, all these things. Uh, that's been changed. Uh, it's, it's been changed in the biggest way in terms of sharing that information in full with state and local governments and with health providers. And so those folks should get all the information. The public information reforms are more mild. New chemical review, this is about when chemicals come on the market since Tosca passed in 1976, that has been tightened also. Uh, and that should be helpful. And then finally there are deadlines that are enforceable. They're long. Uh, when EPA identifies a chemical as a high priority, they have three years to complete the evaluation of whether it is uh, harming people, uh, and then two more years to put in place the restrictions that would prevent that harm. Uh, there are extensions available. And so they're generous deadlines. They're longer than a lot of us would have liked. Um, but if you compare it to a history of EPA evaluations that have dragged on for decades, the deadlines just in of themselves are a big change from the status quo. So next slide. Great. Um, the, the black slide uh, is to talk about preemption. The major thing that the industry, the, the regulated industry, wanted uh, in exchange for having enhanced EPA authority was to expand preemption. Preemption um, describes the circumstances under which the federal law overrules a state or local law. And uh, in a lot of health and safety or, or environmental statutes, the federal law sets a floor but not a ceiling. What Tosca had had before uh, is that the states were only preempted if EPA put in place restrictions, but there was no preemption if EPA declared something safe. So that's the first and most significant expansion of preemption is if, if EPA now declares something safe, after it's gone through a health-only evaluation and it's looked at the vulnerable populations, the disproportionate exposure, et cetera, et cetera, uh, there is limited preemption for um, that chemical. Uh, the thing, and the environmental and public health community was willing to agree to that in some form, by and large, um, if the standard was good enough, if the preemption was limited enough. 
but the industry got something more in this, which was uh, the preemption begins um, before EPA finishes its evaluation. Uh, and they call that pause preemption. We all call it void because it occurs in a regulatory void. Um, and that was something that survived in the bill that we all thought and very disappointed by. But the impact of that at the end of the day, I think, is limited because A, we were able to secure a grace period, working with a lot of people in Congress, where states can, if they act within the first year and a half after EPA identifies a chemical, they're exempted from this clause, so that helps. Uh, and then the, the preemption itself is limited to the pace of what EPA is reviewing. There's no, no state activity is automatically stopped because of this bill. So if EPA doesn't get around to actually uh, reviewing and finishing rules on these chemicals uh, for some reason or another, the preemption doesn't kick in. Uh, and so the very limitation of the bill overall that it's looking at a relatively small number of chemicals at any given time, the EPA under this bill, um, it, uh, winds up also moderating the effect of this preemption. But then there's other exemptions for preemption. All the existing state action that has been taken on a chemical was grandfathered under this law, which is important. Uh, the preemption is limited to whatever EPA actually reviews and rules upon. Uh, so if EPA restricts a chemical based on a concern about cancer uh, and a state goes, oh, wait a second, we've discovered a problem with aquatic toxicity, um, they can still act on that. Uh, and the same thing if the federal government is only looking at these five uses, the um, uh, state is allowed to act on the other uses. Plus, there's all the um, non Tosca uses, cosmetics, food packaging, other things that are, don't fall under the jurisdiction of uh, the Toxic Substance Control Act that are not preempted at all uh, because they're not subject to the bill. Um, and then there's these last ones I mentioned that are explicit. Uh, information collection, reporting, air, water, and waste laws are all exempted. So there's a lot of state activity. Um, uh, the whole scope of activity for most chemicals, because there's still tens of thousands of chemicals, and EPA will be looking at them in batches of 20. Um, so the, the, the pond is still out there for the states to act. Uh, and then there's a lot of stuff they can do even around those 20 uh, because of these um, limitations on preemption. So next slide. So as I said, um, the the main improvement here is that EPA really couldn't do just about anything before on the worst chemicals, uh, not just the worst chemicals, but any existing chemical, but even these ones that we've known a lot about for a long time. And uh, the biggest improvement is now that they, they can and must act on these chemicals and do it in a way that's more in keeping with um, our understanding of the differential vulnerability uh, of human beings to uh, toxic compounds. And this is the list that our coalition uh, put together. EPA has to name uh, its first 10 chemicals by the end of this year. It's actually in December. And then the clock will start on those chemicals. So it's a big test case. And these are the ones that we recommended EPA uh, get started on first. Uh, and it was a mixture of looking at the chemicals that we believe were the most urgent, health threat, and also those where uh, based on the information EPA has at hand now, well, we think they're most likely to have a strong start to be able to succeed with this, with their new authority. So next slide. Okay, so the main takeaways uh, we have is that you know, this was a difficult fight and a lot of the um, press as a result of this has emphasized the controversy and I think that was correct, and we were behind some of that because the, uh, at times the reform on the table really wouldn't have done any good and would have done some harm. But where we ended up is with a law that will do some good. Uh, even if EPA is dealing with a limited number of chemicals, um, if those chemicals can touch millions of people. And TSCA is unique in that it's a law that requires the agency to look at the whole supply chain all along that supply chain, the workers uh, at the plant, workers who might be using it along the way, the uh, communities along the way, the end users, the consumers, and then this inclusion of the disproportionate exposure and the disproportionate susceptibility to harm 
uh, should mean that when EPA does take action, it takes real action, thorough action that protects people. And so that's a big deal uh, and could help millions of people even if the pace is going to be slower than what we all set out for and apply to a more limited number of chemicals in the short run. And it also means, I think, that limited pace means that this is not, um, uh, this doesn't solve the problem of toxic chemicals, not by a long shot. Uh, Europe will continue to, I think, lead the way in regulating chemicals uh, and uh, state activity potentially could as well compared to this federal process is just going to be slow. We're going to need to watchdog EPA's implementation of this and also Congress's oversight of EPA. Um, part of the game in Washington is that the regulated industry, when it doesn't like something, often uh, beats up uh, the agency through their favorite member of Congress, especially if they're well placed. And so keeping an eye on and participating in the political process, both the administrative process, but then also the budget and the oversight process to make sure that we get these benefits from this law is going to be key. And then finally, I think that the, the modest, um, potentially significant improvement that we're going to get to public health if EPA does all these things right in the next several years, it could be outweighed if uh, the, just the passage of this law led to standing down in these other areas. Um, the fact is that uh, uh, retailers right now and other institutional purchasers, healthcare care providers, um, uh, the building industry, a number of other sectors are looking at lists of thousands of chemicals of concern. There's actually some great coming together if you look at Target's list and Walmart's list and uh, the list of the healthcare about harm and um, uh, practice green health groups of what chemicals are of concern. And they're forcing substitution to safer chemicals in the marketplace. And so I think the pace and scope of a lot of that change uh, is critical. And uh, I think some regu the regulated industry will try to hype this reform um, uh, into saying we don't need the state or the marketplace actions anymore, EPA is taking care of it. And if they were to be successful with that, that would potentially lead to flipping this equation where uh, uh, it would, it, this whole thing would do more harm than good because um, uh, a lot of these other areas are making more change more quickly that we need. And so our final message is let's uh, make sure that doesn't happen. Let's get the most out of this law. Let's participate in the political process uh, because there are powerful new tools here we can use to protect people. But let's also collectively keep the pedal down on toxic chemicals uh, through these market campaigns and at all levels of government um, to make sure that we're getting closer to the kind of change we need to really protect public health. So thank you. I'll stop there. Great. Andy, actually, just take us really quick through this last slide we've got on them. Oh, thank you. Yeah. I think the part that helps us the most. Um, uh, we'd love to have you involved uh, with us if you're not already. Uh, the, the, move, the link to join our email list is at the top of our website at saferchemicals.org. Our retailer campaign, uh, mindthestore.org, you can also join us there. Um, we're on Facebook and we're also on Twitter. Um, I'm not good at either of those things, but we are there and, uh, and we get a lot of information out that way and we'd love to have you. Terrific. Andy, thank you so much. Um, sit tight. We're going to close your webcam, pull up Sarah's, and then um, we'll be back. Um, we'll bring yours back up for the Q&A. Thank you. All right, Sarah. I'm going to bring up your webcam here. There we go. We'll close Andy's. Okay, great. And then I'll pull up your slides. Okay, terrific. Take it away. Great. Um, well, thanks, Anne, for this opportunity. Um, as uh, is out there, Safer States is a coalition of health-based coalitions. Imagine Safer Chemicals, Healthy Families, but in the microcosm at the state level. And really, we were there um, as a key part of the base and pushing for Safer Chemicals, Healthy Families um, around Tosca reform and part of trying to strengthen that. Um, but other key parts of our agenda is really using state policy campaigns to create momentum and create actual protections 
um, in the states that model what we really wanted to see federally. Um, and really, the ultimate goal is to build the power and the leverage needed to change what's on store shelves and in people's homes around the nation. Um, 34 states adopted over 170 chemical policies over the last 10 years. Uh, task reform happened, so now what? Next slide. We know that a single protection in a single state is not going to protect the nation. A house needs a roof to keep the rain out. Uh, but we also know that under an ineffective TASCA, we've been living in a house with a very leaky roof for a long time, and we're drenched in chemicals, and they're changing the nation's health. health. There are essential things that a big national policy like TASCA can and should do, which is what Andy was really talking about. But it's really important to know that big policies like TASCA have limitations. Next slide. Fortunately, we don't have to choose between big regulators like the EPA and the FDA and small, nimble, creative state and market campaigns. I want to talk about one chemical as an example and one that's not actually covered by Tosca. Next slide. The chemical triclosan was created in a lab and patented in 1964. It was originally used to very effectively to reduce bacteria in hospital settings. Next slide. It's under the authority of FDA as a drug and under EPA as a pesticide. Products like soap, toothpaste, deodorant must be labeled as a drug listing triclosan. But when it's used in toys or furnishings as a pesticide to preserve the material, it does not have to be labeled. That's EPA. Next slide. It grew from about a dozen consumer products in 1994 to be used in 75% of all liquid soap on the market and more than 2,000 other products. Today, it's also ubiquitous in our lives. Triclosan is found in 75% of urine samples, 95% of breast milk, and is one of the top 10 water contaminants in the United States. Turns out, by the way, it's also an endocrine disruptor, toxic to water systems, and it fuels antibiotic resistance. It took, uh, next slide. It took FDA from 1974 to 2016 to finally regulate the chemical and ban it in household soap. EPA reassessed the safety of the pesticide in 2008 and then urged manufacturers to stop using it in paint. It can still be used without a label in fabrics, plastic, toys, toothbrushes, in other words, a lot of places still. So the FDA took more than 40 years to regulate something that showed reason for concern. What else happened during that time? Well, in 2008, a group of state and federal advocates filed a complaint. Women's Voices for the Earth and others led the charge in exerting consumer pressure for change, while Beyond Pesticides and NRDC put pressure on the authorities. 2010, lawsuit. 2013, becomes part of the hazardous 100 list of chemicals of concern targeted by Mind the Store and then getting ready for baby and the dollar store. 2014, Minnesota becomes the first state to ban triclosan, and many other states continue to introduce policies to keep pressure um, uh, on the marketplace. Oregon and Washington, it became a chemical to avoid as part of the state's green procurement policy. Next slide. Uh, some might look at these scatters uh, and see gaps in protections, but at safer states we see it as a web. Uh, it was not the single strands, but the net that spurred real change in the marketplace. Major manufacturers, including Procter & Gamble, are removing tri triclosan from products. Walmart will no longer sell personal care products containing triclosan. And the FDA estimates that the ban will reduce Americans' exposure to these ingredients by over 2 million pounds a year. I could tell you this story with many other chemicals, like bisphenol A, toxic flame retardants, phthalates, and children's products, where state power, consumer power, advocate engagement made significant change with the federal actions sort of trailing behind following the lead. So what can the states do and our partners that federal agencies can't? Next slide. We can act quickly. Uh, state and consumer action on tri triclosan once underway was making major changes in the marketplace within just a few years. Agencies, as we saw, took decades to act. Same story with toxic flame retardants. Once the powerful California team changed the regulation, that allowed for toxic flame retardant free furniture, states in concert with the market act actors, regulatory strategies that pull in the best science are really helping slam the door 
on these unnecessary toxic additives in furniture and children's products and pivoting uh, to other sectors where those are unnecessary. States can also react quickly to emerging priorities such as drinking water contamination, um, whether from perfluorinated compounds, which are showing up in uh, drinking water as a result of firefighting foam, um, or the reemergence of lead in water systems. And I absolutely anticipate seeing policies introduced to address uh, drinking water concerns in 2017 state legislatures. Next, set, next slide. We can act nimbly. Thousands of chemicals are produced each year in many, many millions of pounds, and they're ending up in our homes, as sort of Andy was saying. You know, the list of targets list is thousands. Under the revised TSCA, it's going to take decades to see action on each of those chemicals. And so as with triclosan, states and retailers can help set priorities and move manufacturers towards action. Priorities are increasingly focused, from my perspective, on product sectors like children's products, food packaging, personal care products, which are about pushing an entire sector to be safer, not just without a specific chemical. I think that's one of the evolutions of the movement. And it's really parallel um, to the push to get companies to develop the chemical policy for their entire company. Uh, like what Mind the Store is doing, creating pressure on the top 10 retailers to develop chemical policies, and like the tool that's been created by Clean Production Action, uh, which helps a company identify their entire chemical footprint. Disclosure and prioritization policies in states are really a key component of helping setting pri set priorities. States have the power to require companies to tell them what's in their products, something that's not going to be broadly required under revised TSCA. Uh, I would argue it's not an accident that Walmart and Target moved to develop policies on chemicals within months of the state of Washington, requiring them to publicly disclose the presence of chemicals in products for children. States can pool that information from their disclosure and prioritization programs in ways that help inform what chemicals EPA selects next in terms of the, what it's going to focus on. But it also will inform the marketplace as well as state's own priorities because it will be filling data gaps and providing information that simply isn't available otherwise. I anticipate absolutely seeing disclosure policies uh, introduced in 2017 that harmonize with market priorities and, and really are designed to fill some key data gaps. Next slide. We can act bigger and smarter together. That web that we talked about that knits together the triclosan story is where I think we're going. Um, but with us more deliberately creating the web, as I mentioned earlier, key partners really came together to create market, state, regulatory, best science, pressure to reduce exposures to and shift the market away from toxic flame retardants and are having real success in key product sectors. I think that's a model that we're, we're continuing to move down. Next slide. And as uh, Andy highlighted, uh, I believe deeper coordination in a time where our opposition is going to tell the world that the problem is solved because of the passage of uh, TSCA. Um, we have already heard that. We will continue to hear that. Um, and there is this sense, okay, now we need to move on. Chemicals are done. Um, even within our own uh, partnerships, uh, not necessarily even just from our opposition. Okay, check. Box done. Um, and that is, as Andy was uh, articulating and clarifying for us, really just isn't the case. And the strategies and tactics that I've talked about are actually things that the states have been doing uh, for years and years in, 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 in areas both under TSCA jurisdiction but also under jurisdiction of, for example, BPA was regulated under FDA. Um, so there are plenty of space for the states to continue to move into the space like food packaging um, or uh, personal care products that uh, need both the federal piece, but then also use that space to help EPA prioritize chemicals that are of real concern to communities and to states, um, and to create information for the marketplace and EPA and the states to actually continue to take action. So 
we the states are going to continue to do what we do best. We're going to be fast, we're going to be nimble, and we're going to be well coordinated. Uh, and we invite you to join us. So you can go check us out on the web um, or Facebook or Twitter. And that's our information. Great, Sarah, thank you very much. Okay, hold, uh, sit tight. We're going to bring up um, Andy's webcam. Okay, great. We can see everybody again. Okay, super. I'm going to just um, put us on the last slide here for just a second and then um, just to let people know that we remind you that we are recording this and we will um, we'll post this um, uh, and we'll email all RSVPs when it's posted. And I see a bunch of um, questions. So let's get to those. Okay. Expand my question window here. Okay. We have um, a question from Alexandra B. And Alexandra, I'm going to go ahead and um, unmute your line. And then um, uh, folks who have questions and haven't submitted them yet, please go ahead and drop them into that little questions pane um, on, your, um, on your dashboard, um, because we would love to get your questions and your thoughts in on this conversation. Okay, with that, I'm gonna go ahead and see if we can get Alexandra's line open. Hi, Alexandra, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you, thanks. Great. Okay, and go ahead. Oh yeah, go ahead. Can you see the question or do you want me to state it? Oh, we always like to let people ask their own question. So if you don't mind. Um, sure, well, my question is really just about the pace of the assessments. My understanding was that the EPA is only required to evaluate a handful of chemicals per year. And given the inventory of chemicals on the market and the hundreds of new chemicals that are being developed every year, the pace, I think I heard um, that they're required to do somewhere between five and 10 per year. Uh, it just seems absurdly low. Like we'll, we'll, never, we'll never reach a critical point of having more chemicals assessed than unassessed. Yeah, the pace is a big, um, a big disappointment. It's not actually written as a per year. That's something we fought for uh, and couldn't get at the high watermark was at one point the house bill required 10 chemicals per year. Uh, the new one requires EPA to have named 10 by the end of this year and um, uh, and three and a half years from now have gone up to 20 and then basically to have at all times 20 that are under uh, that are under review and when it when one drops off to add is finished add another one. Um, they can do more than that. You know, they, it's a minimum, not a, not, it's a minimum requirement, not a maximum requirement. But that's why I highlight that as the key, uh, a key limitation of this bill compared to the problem. I mean, I think that the, the reason why it's still a big deal is that, uh, you know, 10, 20 chemicals being, uh, especially if they're the right chemicals, chemicals that are widely used in commerce and where there's a lot of exposure and uh, they're non-problematic chemicals. It's millions of people that are exposed to those chemicals and restricting them to prevent the exposure could be a very big deal for public health. But it's it's definitely the, the pace is the crux of why we really say this is this is not this is not a reform that's at least at the minimum level that we approach these things, which is you know, will EPA do more? Conservatives will tell you EPA, you know, does way more than they're asked to do, and most environmental groups would say, oh my God, you have to sue them to get them to do the minimum. If you take that second view, uh, the pace that's in this bill is definitely not sized to uh, the size of the problem we have with chemicals. One thing I would point out, though, is depending on how um, creative the agency gets, uh, the testing authority uh, in the bill could be significant. That EPA really could uh, test, order the testing of many more chemicals than that 
smaller number that's under review right there, and combined maybe with other people acting on the results of that testing, we could get more change effectively in the world than just from this narrower uh, pipeline of priority chemicals. So is your sense um, from working with people inside the EPA, is your sense that um, they were waiting for this sort of permission and they actually will take initiative and be creative and use the authority they've been giving as expansively as they can, or, you know? I think it's a mixed bag. I mean, it's, um, uh, I think definitely EPA, this law was unusual in that Tosca, both in testing and in the chemical reviews, the, the way the law was interpreted, and in some ways the label law maybe was intended, it really did block them from doing even the basic thing. And so I think there's a lot of pent up interest in the agency of like, you know, yeah, we're gonna go, we're trying to do this. And they have hit the ground running more or less since it's passed. I haven't talked about a bunch of smaller rulemakings and things that are important rulemakings, but they're, they're wonky. I didn't talk about them here, but they're sort of jumped right in. They've had public meetings and events, et cetera. Um, I think this testing thing is gonna be hard because the, the chemical industry really, really doesn't want there to be testing that isn't immediately being used to craft uh, a federal evaluation. They don't like the idea of data sitting out there and people doing stuff with it. And so I think there will be political resistance to, to some of how we would want to see this thing um, uh, implemented, not just on that, but on some other areas. And that's where the watchdogging comes in. So I think that there is a, a lot of uh, goodwill and pent up interest in the agency of like, wow, they really want to get started, they want to get going on this. Um, but I think there will also be headwinds uh, when they start to do this that mean that we'll, we'll all need to stay on them uh, to, to try and make that happen. Great, thank you. Sarah, is there anything you want to add on that? Oh. Sarah, can you hear me? Oh yeah, Sarah, is there anything you want to, oh, I'm muted. Sorry, I muted myself. Sarah, is there anything that you wanted to add on that? <laughs> uh, um, uh, I think that the pace of evaluation reinforces as you sort of what Andy had just said and, and I was resonating, the need for both the state piece and the market piece big um, when you got Target, have a list of thousands of chemicals, and how do you shift the rest of the marketplace to be thinking about it in, with that kind of breadth? How do you create more um, information in the marketplace so that we can ask better questions that then can inform whatever happens at that federal level, but then just creating more momentum um, and more expectations uh, we have of companies and corporations about how they're treating um, chemicals in their supply chains. Great. Uh, we have an interesting, um, interesting follow-up to this from um, Joanna M. And an interesting um, suggestion of a, a really different approach um, on EPA. Let me pull up Joanna. All right, Joanna, I think your line's open. Hi, can you hear me okay? We can. Oh, great. Um, thanks for having me. Uh, yeah, I um, kind of did have a follow-up with that, and it's a little bit of a two-part thing, I suppose, and the way I phrased it in the question box is, would it be possible for the EPA to create one regulatory action to tax all chemicals of concern by volume and commerce in order to deter their use as a starting point? And there's kind of two parts in there because I say chemicals of concern, and it's based on what California did, was to rely on other people's lists to determine kind of the, the issues with the chemicals it had there. And as a result, it has about 1,200 chemicals mm -hmm. identified. And then I say tax is sort of a way to scale some sort of regulatory action without, you know, if you're doing chemical by chemical, you have to go through that entire process individually. But if you can just create one structure to affect the market, um, in one regulatory action, you're, you're, you're kind of accelerating that process. So I don't know whether any of that is possible, but I was very curious about that. Um, it's interesting. I think uh, that there, 
they're probably unlikely to try and do that at least soon. But there are there are opportunities to group chemicals to a degree. The EPA has already done that, and um, to some degree. So they have on their chemical work plan list, uh, you know, a, a group of phthalates that they're dealing with as as a as a thing, as just uh, you know, as if it was one, as opposed to having to go through each one. And they have like a cluster of flame retardants. And I think the more they do stuff like that, it might be a way of getting more review, um, you know, uh, pound for pound. And then on the um, the testing thing, uh, there's a, a sort of industry got a thing in there that says this can't be used for a minimum data set. And uh, a lot of us feel like that, the way that's worded, it's, you know, if EPA asked a bunch of people to do some basic testing, the law clearly gives them the authority to do that. What is a minimum data set? Oh, I, I said te to tax, not to test, but to tax. So create oh, a tax chemicals um, that are of concern, that are used in commerce as a way to deter their use and they oh, go a little more expensive to do that under this law. I can't imagine that. I'm sorry. I missed. Uh, oh, okay. I didn't. There are, I didn't mention money, which is not what you're getting into. There are fees in the bill uh, to fund the program, um, uh, and they're, they're capped. And so there's there's new money that comes from fees, but Congress will still need to appropriate money. That's not what you're talking about as a policy choice, but just um, uh, there's no authority to tax chemicals sort of deliberately to disincentivize their use in the bill. Thank you, Joanna. We've got a question from Craig S. Um, about um, also a different approach about um, trying to change our uh, legislators a little bit. Let's see if we can bring Craig up here. All right, Craig, let's see if we can hear you. Can you hear me? Yeah, go ahead. Great. Uh, yeah, I just, you know, uh, it's a very interesting concept to usurp uh, the feds by going to the states, and it seems like it's working really well, and uh, I think we can all enjoy that. But I'm wondering, you know, what it would take uh, to basically take back our Congress and uh, get it back to working for the people, by the people, and one of the ways uh, that we know works is by, um, you know, uh, banding together, as you all have, with all these different organizations and creating a formidable lobby. And uh, so we've got lobbies going against lobbies. Uh, again, holding Congress to task to do their jobs. That's it. Oh. Did I miss the end? I couldn't tell if there's more the end of that question, you're saying, because that is what we sort of did, uh, is, is band together. Um, it's still an asymmetric uh, environment um, in that the, the chemical industry, um, you know, has enormous amounts of resources for lobbying and where they don't have the grassroots support, they went out and hired these firms to sort of dig it up. Uh, so I, at times we had this battle between their insider money-based access and uh, our sort of breadth and the authenticity and legitimacy of the, the various people uh, in this coalition and the, the, where they came from that legislators could hear. Uh, but then they also were competing and sort of purchasing grassroots support at times. And they do have some grassroots support that is generally theirs in terms of people in the industry or in the regulated industry. Um, but I, you know, I've worked on campaign reform in the past, and uh, this fight has made me feel that it's um, it's really important. I mean, it would make a difference if we had that. So I don't know if that gets at what you were getting at, but I would agree with that. I know Sarah, if you have. It's a it's a big challenge. You know, one of the things that happened in the state legislatures in was redistricting uh, in 2010 which led to real changes in state legislatures and I would say a, a lack of openness to the conversation, even though really it, it's, it's bipartisan, there's bipartisan support for it. 
uh, people get it, um, and especially when you get to a vote, it's really hard to vote against poisoning babies uh, or for poisoning babies. Um, but it's hard to get it to that point. Um, and the conversation around how do we shift our politics to be uh, more less about money and more about representation is huge. Um, and so it is a part of what many of our partner groups are working on um, and, uh, and just trying to figure out how to leverage that collective into that broader conversation, but it's so big, it's hard to know exactly which point and part to, to, to move that's actually going to change the game. Thank you, Craig. Uh, we have a couple of diff different questions um, and that are related and time, I think, just to kind of talk to them um, uh, a little bit big picture in a bunch. We have one from Malin and from Susan. They're about um, how different ways that we might educate um, the public in terms of, um, and maybe it's best to just ask about some of the things that both of your coalitions are doing to educate the public. We have questions about um, uh, briefings for um, people, including um, industry. We have questions about um, could we set up a program to educate high school students about some of these issues. And so I'm just interested um, uh, the talks given by the Green, Policy, Green Science Policy Institute are noted. Um, and I know that, that you all are working with them. So um, maybe just talk a little bit about um, the work that you're doing as a coalition or that you know some of your, um, uh, your partners are doing to try to, and this webinar today counts <laughs> for sure, but to bring these issues to, um, to a wider audience to get even more people involved. Well, so for example, um, in Minnesota, um, they're doing healthy home house parties um, and going out and in, actually into people's homes to talk about these issues in, a, in an environment where you can actually point to things and be like, we're talking about that and that and that, and that really brings it down to folks and grounds it in a different way. Um, and it's also, you know, like friend to friend kind of Tupperware party kind of framework, which also has a way that validates messages and then you, you can replicate that. So that's just one example of a model that somebody could tap into and, and if they wanted to replicate it. I think we're, we've definitely done, especially recently, more public education around our market campaigns focused on retailers because it's been uh, you know, simpler and more straightforward for the general public. So for people to get on our list, you'll hear a lot about that. Um, we have had a group of organizations you know, that are in the coalition meeting to get their heads around some of the more technical issues in implementation. But I think that the, the kinds of things that we're, um, we're about to enter a, uh, this fall, I think, uh, a space where the, the Tosca issues will become um, more real and will be need to get back out there. So when EPA does pick its 10 chemicals and we're, uh, we're going to want to uh, work with and reach out to the communities that we're aware of that live near the facilities where chemicals are uh, used and produced. I think we're going to want to have targeted education with the uh, workers in some of these facilities um, uh, so that we can all stand together and we can integrate that information and, um, and advocacy as much as possible. But I will say, you know, mea culpa for me too, this legislative debate got difficult in terms of we were fighting over some stuff that's pretty hard for even uh, nerds like myself to, to understand and, uh, uh, and the implementation gets even more so. So it is a challenge to um, uh, to take this these discussions wider in a meaningful way. But I think when EPA actually starts looking at chemicals and we can really talk about here's how you are impacted by that chemical as a consumer. Here's how you're impacted by it maybe as a worker who uses um, a material. Uh, you don't manufacture the chemical, but you use something that has it uh, in a janitorial context or an auto mechanic or something like that. And then also, um, 
uh, with the you know with the communities that are along the chain. That is one thing about this wall that is is unique. Is it is one of the only walls that really looks at the whole picture of the chemical, and the EPA is supposed to look at that whole picture and intervene anywhere along that whole supply chain where people are being put at risk. And I think it will take a lot of public outreach to to involve the people who are hit along that supply chain um, to make this work and to make this issue alive, at least the federal part of it, for more people. So I think we, we do need to do more of that. Terrific. Um, I don't know if, um, Sarah and Andy, I don't know if you can stay on for one more minute. If you can, we have um, an interesting question from Claire B. about um, using procurement um, in these campaigns, using procurement policies. Do you have uh, one or two more minutes? Or um, if not, I can um, send you that question and get your thoughts um, by email. You know, simple to say, um, procurement at the corporate or state or local level is a key potential strategy um, that folks are already utilizing um, and likely will continue to do. Um, it takes capacity to educate uh, procurement professionals, uh, you know, and how it fits into their sustainability definitions, um, which they already are moving uh, around climate change and other priorities. And so the question is, how does this fit into that? Um, and that's the opportunity now. So it is something that's on our agenda. I would agree with that. And um, I think, uh, I don't know if that's actually, or you said Claire B, if that's Healthy Schools Network. Right? <laughs> yep. That's a great procurement effort right there. I think those kinds of institutional purchasing where you know, we do want to rally the general public and, and average consumers, um, but it's hard to do that around big lists of chemicals, right? I mean, it's um, uh, that's where the, the thing that has been derided by the industry and that some of us have also tried to, you know, get away from the times of the chemical of the month. Uh, idea that something is in the news, but you know the fact is the average person. Um, it's hard to keep all of this stuff straight, and to make an impact, you need to sometimes get very specific about this chemical and that product, uh, and here's what you can do about it as an individual. But the procurement is one of those places where we can have professional people over time really look at large, larger numbers of chemicals, and excuse me, also really impose requirements that we're not just moving away from a known bad, but that you want to move the person supplying you to a known good and not just an unknown. And that's, that comes back to this uh, uh, thing that I hope gets used in this law, and that we'll not just hope, but we'll be working to try and make this happen, uh, is can EPA use its testing authority and maybe its targeted ways on that? They're eliminating the world of alternatives. So where we have a lot of uh, movement from a uh, uh, known bads that is sort of waiting is kind of held at the pen because well, we're moving toward what? And we want that alternative to be vetted as well. Is that a place where the testing authority can, can help? You know, shine a light here, this thing has been looked at. Um, but I would definitely agree that that's another important place to keep the pressure on. Terrific. I'm just going to pull up um, one more time the slides showing. Um, from each of your organizations how to get more information and how to get involved. Um, just a couple beats on this one and then a couple beats on um, Sarah's. And I want to thank you both so much um, for your presentations today. Um, it was uh, really great. We're walking away with um, a lot to think about and um, some good ways to find out more information and get involved. And I really appreciate it. And I also want to thank our audience so much for being here today. And let me bring up um, let me bring up our other slide here and let everyone take a look at that one more time. And thank you very much again. If people have um, uh, questions, um, just send them to me. And, um, and we look forward to getting you information about more webinars that are coming up down the road. And thanks once again to Sarah and Andy for today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.